Hey guys, happy Wine Wednesday. Happy Wine Wednesday. <laughs> oh, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we just moved from, uh, I had to move Carl, relocate him from outside to inside. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we're going to do a quick one because no, okay. We are traveling. We are in Victoria. For those of you that uh, know what's been going on in the Okanagan, we were in Niagara when it went down with the fires horrible horrible situation and our hearts go out to everybody that's been affected especially uh those who have lost their homes or were evacuated and everybody who um were first responders and especially the firefighters so we just want to say a huge thanks to them when we saw what was happening on the news tragic scenes like these we decided to fly into uh, Vancouver and come to Victoria where we have family so we wouldn't be going back right to the middle of it in the Okanagan. Our house was not affected, thankfully, but there was smoke everywhere. Very heavy, very horrible smoke for a few days. Mm -hmm. But today we've got good news. Look at this. For Wine mm -hmm. Wednesday, we've got this scene at Black Market this morning in Caledon. We've got this scene at Wild Goose further south this morning this scene from Kelowna this morning. Mm -hmm. So things are looking up, which is really, really good news. And I hope it stays that way. And uh, I think one of the things we encourage members and everyone to do during this hard time for the Okanagan is to support local businesses. Now that the extreme situation is starting to get a little bit relieved, uh, I think this is a good time to start supporting local businesses. So uh, this week we are featuring two Okanagan wineries, which is awesome, and they're uh, by the same owner, so we get to put them in the same box if you want uh, to be shipped to your door. And uh, so to start off, we're going to go and chat with um, the winery, and then we're going to um, and then we're going to do a recap of the Pan Canadian Masterclass. How are you doing, Carl? I'm doing good. You seem pretty stressed. No, there you go. <laughs> I just can't see myself because I'm in the mm, in the light <laughs> in the light here. But uh, hey, anyway, so and a couple week a couple years ago, we had the chance to uh, spend some time with uh, Kyla and Rudy down in uh, Osoyos for a uh, a nice weekend of uh, brainstorming. And uh, <clears throat> there was a what a lovely uh, meetings. And, like there were so many great people from the wine industry down there at that time. And uh, I think we had a feeling right there that there's going to be a, a great, um, a great fit for the BC wine industry to have these people joining the, uh, the, the family of the BC wine owner. But uh, yeah, we had some uh, great chat and here we are two years later and seeing their business thriving and today we have the chance to chat with Andrew Young. Andrew is the uh, is the general manager and operation manager at Stoneboat and Valley Common. And uh, Andrew's going to join us to chat about these two portfolio. Andrew, ha uh, welcome, welcome to Wine Wednesday. Welcome to Carl's to Carl's Wine Club, uh, Wine Happy Hour. Well, great to have you. Wow, beautiful view behind you, Andrew. Yeah, we're here in the beautiful South Okanagan. You obviously showed some pictures um, a little further north than us. Um, we've really, uh, we've bounced back and we're very fortunate, I think, um, down this way um, that we avoided some of the challenges that our uh, neighbors to the north in the Cologne area faced. And um, we're really grateful and thankful to the community and um, all the support that we've seen. And 
um, you know, we're just trying to do everything we can to uh, make it through a good season and to uh, support our neighbors where we can. So that's where we're at. And yeah, thanks for having us on, Carl. It's a real pleasure to be here with the, the Carl's Wine Club team and to uh, chat about some wine and our, our unique projects. Yeah, but, and and sorry for the for the logistic here. Um, yeah, we're gonna do it with what we have. But I think the 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 key thing is that it's the meat on the bone around the bone here. It's what we have to offer to Carl's Wine Club members this week. And uh, for the first time, we have two wineries in the same box, so it's pretty quite exciting. And for me, the most exciting part is we have so much so many different style of wine available but having that that like you know iconic winery from the south of the okanagan who's been there for almost 50 years and that new rising star that newcomer but making different style of wine completely different style and what we have to offer here is like from one spectrum all the way to the other extreme. So Mira and I here are like completely at the, I'm on Pinot Noir here. She's on Cabernet Sauvignon, but everything can be on the same box. So Andrew, first and foremost, I would like, let's start with Valley Common, okay? Let's start with the new guys on the block. Let's start with the inception of Valley Common. Can you please tell us a little bit more on how everything takes shape? Absolutely, Carl. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're we're a new and old brand, and it's quite an interesting and unique position to be in. We have this beautiful legacy property behind me. I'm here at Stoneboat, um, but Valley Commons is the vision of um, Kyla Verhoof and, or sorry, Kyla Ritchie and Rudy Verhoof. Apologies. Um, they're our owners, and they're two really exceptional people. Um, you saw the beautiful family in the photo earlier with their son Mac. Uh, Mackie is uh, having all the fun. We were on a conference call earlier and he's having a <laughs> great time in the background. Um, but um, just really great people. And I think where this whole concept sort of came about was um, Kyla and Rudy were both professional volleyball players. They lived and traveled around the world to be able to do that. They actually were both captains of Team Canada um, at certain points um, and competed in the Olympics and, and, like I say, professionally around the world. And in their travels, they fell in love with wine and uh, they fell in love with the idea of wineries in particular, I think, and were able to, when they retired um, at a very young age, you know, as you do when you're a professional athlete, they decided to go into a second career of um, executing and operating wineries and, and making some really cool wines, um, which is exciting. Um, the whole concept, I guess, at its core is really the connection of both the Fraser Valley and the Okanagan Valley. So to, two wine regions, although the Okanagan is our primary focus right now, we do have a vineyard down in the Fraser Valley. And what we're trying to do is we're just trying to create wines that are unique and honest and that speak to the regions that we're producing in. But our philosophy is about bringing people together. And um, I often tell people this, I think it's really cool. Our mission statement is actually not about making wine, it is about creating community and connection. And we accomplish that through making uniquely honest and sort of passion driven wines. And so I think that comes through in all the bottles. It's a newer brand. And so we've got some learning, of course, as you do when you have a new brand, but we're really fortunate because we were able to put that new brand in conjunction with Stoneboat, a brand that has been around, as you said, um, vineyards planted in the seventies. And so we've been able to have an experience in the winemaking side um, coming from Bill Adams, the winemaker at Stoneboat, who was involved in starting the project. And now we have Kyle, uh, Kyle Lyons, who's our um, current winemaker for Valley Commons, a really, really talented guy making some very, very cool wines for us. So we're very lucky on that front. And that's funny because you're mentioning building communities and all of that, like one of the mission statement of uh, Valley Common. The location of where you guys at in the Okanagan absolutely reflect the whole sense of what you guys try to accomplish. So you guys are, are located at the District Wine Village. And uh, for our many listeners who are uh, located in the eastern part of the country, we're having the chance to visit the Okanagan. Andrew, how about you give us a little, you give them a little sense of what's the District Wine Village? Absolutely. Um... That's a really great question, Carl. So the District Wine Village is kind of one of a kind. Um, it is a place where um, young and new wineries can find a start. 
And it's basically a community of um, small wineries in one central plaza. Um, in that space, we have uh, 13 wineries, we have an arts shop, we have a brewery, a distillery, and we also have a restaurant. So a really amazing and special space. Um, as you can see in the pictures here, um, you have this beautiful center concourse area um, where we host concerts and other events. And then around the outside, that's where you're going to find the wineries and uh, other businesses. What's amazing about it is it's a place, first of all, for people to enter the industry. And I think the wine industry, you know, can be a bit of a hurdle uh, or two on the way in. And um, it's a kind of challenge that um, this space allows people to sort of not skip, but certainly um, jump into the industry a little bit more easily. What's amazing about it, too, is it brings its own guests. And so it allows you to expose your new brand and kind of create uh, create your own sort of concept with a good exposure based on the village. So really, really cool. Um, we're really happy to be partners with the Wine Village. And um, we uh, we see a lot of um, new guests because of being part of that sort of space. So it's really amazing. And it's not only like 10 different uh, 10 different tasting rooms together. It's more than that because you guys produce the wine on site. What we don't see mm -hmm. is behind the, the bar, there's the barrels, there's the whole production, the, these mini production facilities. Am I correct here? That's correct. Yeah, we actually, um, to be in that space, you have to produce on site. If you do not, then you can't actually produce there or can't be uh, in a tasting room there. And so every winery makes wine on site, which is really cool. Um, it can create a little bit of a, a bottleneck come harvest season when everyone's trying to receive t uh, bins at the same time. But um, it creates more community because it means our winemakers have to work collaborati collaboratively and we build relationships with all of these other wineries. So it's a really special space and um, making wine on site adds an element of authenticity, I think, to the space. If we Absolutely. just made wine somewhere else and then trucked it in, it would just feel like a storefront. But each of these little wineries is genuinely that it is a little winery it's not just meant to feel that way and i think that's really cool so yeah it is really really cool and i think this place as it grows i think also the uh, uh the um the Okanagan Wine College or something like that are also involved with the with the development of the place. I think, yeah, in the future, this place has a lot of potential to be the center of so many great discovery and so many opportunities in the South Okanagan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Mike was saying uh, Valley Commons is in the village, right? And then Stoneboat, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, is not at the village, right? It is not at the village. Stoneboat has his own, for like, and for like, for like many, 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 many years Since now. 1979. So, right? 1979. Yeah. So the Black Sage Bench. How far are Stoneboats to the uh, the village? Like less than 15 minutes apart, I would say. Yeah, um, yeah it's about 15 minutes. Um, pretty much along Black Sage and then Tucklemewit Drive. So if you're familiar with the area, then that's uh, places you'll know because that's where a lot of the wineries are located along that sort of road. Um, and yeah, 15 minutes apart. So close, but you know, not too close. <laughs> <laughs> hey, okay. So now we introduce Valley Common. Uh, we're going to get back to their portfolio in a few minutes, but I just would like to for people who've never heard about Stoneboat, that's not, and probably not many of these people around the country, but because Stoneboat's been around for so long, what defined Stoneboat in the nutshell, uh, Andrew? Yeah, that's you know, it's an interesting question, and it's something we we grapple with. Um, so Stoneboat was founded by the Bartnuck family. Um, they moved here from the Lower Mainland, and we are. Um, primarily, I guess I would say, producers of Pinot varietals. So we produce Pinot Gris. We produce sparkling with Pinot Blanc. We produce Pinot Noir, of course. Um, and then we also have Pinotage, which is a bit of an unusual varietal. Um, the family that first planted and founded the winery um, have South African roots. And so um, Pinotage made a lot no, of sense. sense. And it's an interesting and slightly different varietal that we produce that not a lot of other people in the Okanagan and really not a lot of people in the world have outside of that one South African region. Um, Stoneboat is quite intriguing because our vineyards are all um, self or own rooted. 
And so we have no rootstock on site, which actually provides us um, some really great quality in the glass and also allows us to deal with some of the challenging um, weather conditions that can arise in the Okanagan, um, where our vines are a little more um, sustainable, I guess, in terms of their life cycle and we can sort of keep them healthy. In addition to all of that, um, Stoneboat has a history of producing some really amazing sparkling wines. Um, and so we are the first producers of um, Charmat style sparkling or the Prosecco style sparkling in British Columbia, which is oh, cool. Wow. And um, we have the oldest Charmat tanks in the in the province um, on site here. And so we've, um, we've tried to be innovative where it's um, beneficial, but we've tried to sort of play to our strengths, which is making wines that are very honest, um, speak to terroir, and are really um, sort of about our sense of place here. Um, I don't know if everybody knows what a stone boat is. I'm assuming not everybody does because I get the question often. A stone boat yeah. is actually um, basically a sled. And what you would do historically is you would clear rocks from a farm site. And when you cleared those rocks, um, it allowed you to then go through and plant. And if you didn't do it, you would damage your planting equipment. When this vineyard site was originally planted back in 1977, as mentioned, it was cleared with a stone boat. And so our name is actually in reference to sort of our humble beginnings and the hard work that goes into making wine. And um, I think it's really important to share that part of our story as well, because I think it's a truly special part of it. Yeah, and I, there's a couple questions that keep coming to mind, but I was reading about how the reason you had to clear the stones is actually part of the reason why the site is so special in terms of winemaking too, right? Stones like that are not that common where you are. Oh, that's why, because I keep, I, I like when I talk and when I describe wine from the Black Sage Bench or from the Golden Miles, it really the rocky soils comes in, right? We often talk about sandy soil. We often talk about uh, clay and loam, but like rock, no. So, no, yeah. so it's interesting to hear that very story, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Our vineyard site is and quite special. that was special. a stone boat, by the way. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, this, sorry, yeah, this is stone a boat. stone boat. They threw, they threw the rocks on the back there in the old days. And then um, these are some of the stones right from your property, right? That kind of come up through the dirt. Like they're always coming up, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, that's like a little known fact. Uh, you would assume rocks would sink, but they actually float. Um, in dirt, which is very strange. Um, what's quite interesting about our vineyard site is we're located in a microclimate. And I think that's kind of the story of the Okanagan. There's many different microclimates here. And our vineyard site is extremely rocky soil, certainly um, more so than most other wineries uh, in the area. Um, and what's cool about that is those rocks, as they sit through the um, season, end up building up calcium deposits underneath the rock. And that's where the vine's naturally going to set its roots to because that's where the moisture tends to last the longest in the soil. And so what we end up with is really beautiful complexity because of these calcium covered rocks. Additionally to that, we end up with um, a nice sort of ability to retain heat in vineyard. And we're in a part of the valley with what's referred to as a very high diurnal range. So our daytime temperature is quite hot, but our nighttime temperatures can be actually quite cool. And so a little bit of heat in vineyard is going to help us with the ripening process through the season. Um, and so the vineyard is extremely important to us. Just over 10 acres planted, um, like we said, back in the 70s. This is a vineyard site with a lot of legacy um, and that's consistently proved uh, to be of high quality as well. So we're really fortunate to be able to produce wine from here. And it's remind me the old uh, the old countries in France, especially in the Rhone Valley, the northern Rhone, where these big pebbles, the Côte Rotti or Hermitage, right, where they like the heat gets into the rocks and it like diffuses the heat throughout the vineyard throughout the days. Yeah, um, yeah I'll remind you later cool. that we compared our vineyard to uh, Hermitage. Just uh, just saying, but um, yeah, we're we're extremely fortunate. I think. Um, it's a very special site. You can see it right behind me here, past the trucks. Um, and uh, yeah, a really great legacy of production here. Well, then special sites usually produce special wines. Like, I mean, like to me, it's it's that's the start of everything. It's about the site. It's about the vineyards. And you guys having such a special site. And uh, let's get into the wine because 
uh, before I jump right away to the gold medal, uh, 91 plus points, Carl's Wine Club, Pinot Noir. Let's get to the piano because uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Charmat Method, beautiful expression of Pinot Blanc, really clean, really pure but energetic bubbles. Oh my God, like you drink that, like the bubble burst out of the glass. Uh, so how, what's the production in terms of, uh, of piano? Yeah, um, so as mentioned, we have the two Charmat tanks. Um, piano process wise is very much about, um, similar to all our wines, creating something with complexity that's approachable, but that you want to uh, enjoy often, hopefully. And I think the best part about piano for me is that it's got this, as you mentioned, kind of like vibrancy to it. We're dealing with a um, Pinot Blanc, um, you know, pretty much 100% Pinot Blanc in most vintages with potentially a little bit of blending. Um, a wine that's going to be made in that Charmat tank. And so we get that touch of autolysis in it, that beautiful, subtle little bit of brioche on the back palate. But we're harvesting this wine really beautifully um, to be able to deliver subtle floral, zesty citrus, and then these lovely sort of crunchy green apple, early season kind of white peach flavor profiles. Great complexity. And one of my favorite parts about this wine, to be super honest, is I love that it's a wine that I don't need to be precious with. And what I mean by that is... Often when you're buying sparkling, I always want to say, I'm going to buy Bollinger Grand Anne. I'm buying vintage champagne. And then you must sit that in the corner of your fridge until a special occasion. This isn't a wine you need to save for a special occasion. It's a wine you should celebrate and enjoy every day because, you know, life is meant to be enjoyed. And I think that's where piano really comes through. Um, yeah, just a really, uh, really beautiful and complex sparkling, but that's approachable. Mm. You know, and you talk about that, you know, what was my uh, my assessment after that I tasted the sparkling pop and pour and all of that. I went through the whole lineup and I came back at the end. It's the base juice, like even yeah. the juice without the bubbles, like we're talking about approachability. We're talking about like like um, easy going and all that. That's exactly what it is. When I was tasting base, strictly the base juice, that's where I really got my connection with that wine. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh I think that uh, now you guys should bring the fruits to the winery probably pretty soon. I mean, it's August. Uh, it's August, what, 20, 23rd. 23rd today. Yeah. You're in the south of the Okanagan. Sparkling fruits come early. This year, everything is a little early. So my expectation, probably in the next uh, 10 days, these, the, the fruits are going to come to the winery. Correct. Yeah, we have our first fruit coming in next week. Um, next week, eh? That's there you go. Now, to be fair, that isn't for the piano. Um, it's for a bit of an interesting project that we have coming up. Um, but uh, oh, don't, but don't be, be secretive. You're live right now. You have thousands of people listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the things we're we're trying out, and I think we're quite excited to try out, is actually a um, Blanc de Noir. So we're going to be bringing in Pinot Noir quite early, um, and we're going to be producing it in line with kind of a classic Chardonnay technique. Um, so press off quickly, and uh, I think it's going to be quite intriguing. So we're trying that out specifically because of the smoke season. We thought we would um, try something new and see if we can create something of high quality. Um, we've been, like I say, quite fortunate this year because of smoke, and I think we're less impacted than many, which you know we're thankful for. Um, but we still want to make sure we're uh, make, taking steps. That said, sparkling will be coming in very, very soon. Um, we're expecting that probably in about two weeks, and we're really excited to be able to get another batch of piano to everybody so everyone can continue to enjoy those beautiful fresh bubbles. There you go. Hey, I have a quick question about Stone Boat. Um, we were talking about the uh, rootstocks being own rooted, right? Yeah. How did that help you guys this last winter? We had, I mean, we talk about the fires, it's a horrible, horrible situation right now but also wineries are recovering from a terrible winter with like 60 percent 70 percent loss for some vineyards yeah. did you guys find um, that the own rooting helped you guys a little bit with that it absolutely does um it's yeah. interesting so that's a really great question i wish i could take you in the vineyard now and actually show you <laughs> how it sort of impacts us um so for I'm going to assume um, a certain level of knowledge about wine, and I'm sorry if I'm talking down to anybody. But um, when, you're, when you're dealing with vines, what happens as you get to the end of the year 
is that vine converts a bunch of sugar and basically stores it in its wood. And that's how it's able to survive through the winter. When you're dealing with own rooted vines, they're more efficient at kind of affecting that process, which is step one of being helpful. The second thing that's quite helpful is any of our vines that were damaged by our um, extremely cold for the Okanagan standards winter, i.e. hitting minus 28 to minus 30, um, and where we saw some vine loss, we were able to um, regrow those vines based on what's called the sucker or the sort of tertiary mm -hmm. shoot that comes right off the rootstock. And okay. so if you are not own rooted, um, mm -hmm. first of all, we had a much higher survival rate in our vineyard, which is great. We had a higher primary bud survival rate and secondary bud survival rate, which is awesome. But even the vines that died were able to salvage some of them. And that's because uh, right above the sort of rootstock where it comes up out of the ground, this one shoot uh, is always going to try and push. That's the vine's kind of backup survival mechanism. And mm. so not next year, but the year following, we should be able to get fruit off of those and kind of retrain those vines. Mm. And so, okay. you know, we're fortunate because it means we're on a two year return to producing high quality grapes with a great rootstock as opposed to potentially as much as five years to be back to high quality fruit off of an equivalent vine. And yeah. um, that's really, really helpful to us. So yeah, great question. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we're going to go a little qu quicker here. So this is a 90 point rosé. Uh, one of uh, not many 90 points rosé that I gave to my, uh, during the, uh, the, our rosé marathon here out of 57 that we had. I really like that. It's a clean approach of Pinot Noir. Really, clean, really pure, really South Okanagan. And uh, I, yeah, I truly enjoy that. It's not too late for rosé. So we've decided to get going with that Stoneboat rosé. What it's, would you say? It's never too late for rosé. It's never I'm too sorry. late. No. I know, I know, I, I know. It's 12 months a year, rosé. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the delicacy of Pinot Noir rosé, to my personal opinion, I think there's no other grape like Pinot Noir for rosé. Uh, Andrew, what's make that rosé special? Yeah, I mean, we're dealing with Pinot Noir primarily coming from our own vineyard site. So again, high level of control on fruit. And we are in a situation where we have that beautiful sort of complexity of Pinot Noir with this lovely kind of citrus zestiness in the wine. Um, yeah, it's just, it's not trying to be heavy handed. It's trying to be approachable and it tastes really great. Um, and I think it really delivers honestly on our vineyard site. So I love that about it. Um, yeah, and I, I like uh, so 2022 for whites and roses. I think that the flavor definition is absolutely fantastic for that vintage. So yeah, a real or a real treat. Uh, let's move on to uh, <clears throat> to me. It's probably the star of the pack. Uh, there's many great wines in there, but this one resonated to me a lot. So it's Stonebow Pinot Noir 2020 vintage. Uh, gold medal, uh, 91 plus points, Carl's Wine Club. This is to me, uh, the quintessential South Okanagan Pinots. When we're talking about balance, I've seen too many times heavy Pinot Noir coming from the South Okanagan, uh, the 14.5 and 14.7 percent alcohol, and uh, but this is a balanced Pinot, it's fruity. A hint of earthiness. It's not candied fruit. It's like everything that I'm looking forward, like a little bit more new world, but also with a terrific balance. And that you mentioned that diurnal temperature, you can feel it, the fresh, the, the freshness in that Pinot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love this wine. Um, that's actually what I'm I'm drinking right now as well, Carl. Um, right, so to that, my friend, because that's what yeah, I was, I'm doing. <laughs> what I love about it is it speaks to me of everything I like about Pinot Noir. It has absolutely some of those cherry um, and sort of tart red fruit flavor profiles forward. Um, it speaks to the fact that they're not overcooked and jammy, but they're very fresh and delivering really beautifully. As our Pinot Noir in this series um, of wines ages into itself, we get these beautiful kind of dried flavor profiles around the fruit, which I love and make it really exciting. It's already kind of shifting a little bit that way. Um, and then finishing with that like earthiness and just a hint of herbaceousness, which speaks to the South Okanagan, our, our lovely terroir. Um, it's a wine that kind of yeah, it just delivers on the promise of what Pinot Noir can be. And I think you really taste that minerality in the wine as well. That Absolutely. sort of calcium-rich soil. Yeah, stunning wine. 
I'm really, Absolutely. really happy to sell this one. <laughs> yeah, no, really, really yeah. happy with that. I'm, I'm super thrilled. So this is the three wines from uh, from the the Stone Boat portfolio in the pack, and we're moving on to the three from Valley Common, where we have the Harvest White, uh, which which uh, just won a big award recently, right? The twenty uh, the twenty twenty one Harvest White. Uh, no, the Harvest White. Sorry, is in, in the, the bonus in a picks. bonus pick. Yes. You are correct. We are doing. Mira, refresh my memory here. We I have took, a, a Cap Franc. The Cap Franc. I know, I know the Cap Franc. We got the, um, oh, come on, Carl, the Harvest, the table, the Harvest table red. But we have the, oh, the Pinot Gris. There you go. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, Valley Common Pinot Gris that I tasted with you this summer when I visited earlier this summer that I really, really, really enjoy. Um, so where is the fruit is coming from, from the Valley Common Pinot Gris? Yeah, so this fruit is um, is non-estate fruit. This is coming from up in the uh, kind of Peachland area. Um, what we're dealing with here too is, I think, a wine that has um, a bit of a generosity for for um, a Pinot Gris. And I think um, when people think of Pinot Gris, I think they often sort of think of it as being a little bit of um, like a really approachable wine. Um, but sometimes I think people confuse approachability and simplicity. This is certainly not a simple wine, but it is a wine with great approachability. It's textural, but it's not overly heavy. It's bright and fresh, but it doesn't have a runaway acidity. And it's got generosity of fruit and some interesting kind of subtle um, oak characteristic in the finish because this wine was partially uh, matured in oak. And as a consequence of that, you sort of get this really, really great rounding of flavors and this nice sort of medley um, in the glass. But at the sort of core of it all, it delivers that beautiful, refreshing quality that Pinot Gris can bring and an ability to pair beautifully with food that Pinot Gris is so beautiful at as well. Uh, you know, like, like uh, Pinot Gris, I think Pinot Gris is the most planted white wine in the Okanagan. And I think too many times you encounter a boring Pinot Gris like, like, like everyone else. This one really stands out because you mentioned it, complexity and textural for me i love the texture i love the length but also like the sequence of it when it enter a little bit like textural but also at somewhere in the middle you get a little bit of that of that uh, um, uh not bitterness but like that that citrusy that citrus peel where it brings a little bit of a torque in the middle and i really yeah. like the aspect of it absolutely it's very well made yeah, lovely zestiness to it for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, we have the uh, the harvest the harvest table red, the twenty twenty vintage. I believe that this wine is priming right now. I mean, we're three years in. This, to my opinion, this wine was made to be consumed in its early stage. To my uh, to my belief, this wine has been built just not for simplicity. But for its easygoingness, something not not something too cerebral, something to be yeah. consumed with ease. Absolutely, I often, um, yeah, I'm completely aligned. When we talk about <laughs> Harvest Table Red, we're really talking about a wine that's sort of an homage to the history of winemaking. Um, once upon a time, winemakers would make a wine this year to drink next year during harvest. And we wanted to sort of reference that, a place where the wine community would gather um, and something that ties into our core philosophy. And so a wine like this is not meant to be a multi-decade aging wine. It's a wine that's meant to be um, something that's enjoyed in its first, you know, three, four years, maybe. Um, I think it's of higher quality than those historical harvest wines would have been because those would have been sort of the leavings. We're very intentional about this wine, but what we don't want to do is create a wine that is overly intense. We have other wines in our portfolio that are more designed to take age. This is meant to be a red that's drank a little more youthful, potentially served a little bit chilled. And I think it can stand up to all of that really beautifully. A lovely mix of uh, Pinot Noir and Gamay, creating some definitely generous fruit forward flavors, nice, taut, crisp, crunchy fruit, not getting into overly sort of jammy fruit but finishing with interesting earthy and gamey characteristics, very much in reference to some of the more sort of elevated French um, gamets in particular, I think, and a wine that pairs extremely well with food with a great acidity. 
Um, this is like my pizza dinner wine. You know, that's where I think this wine is at its absolute best. Um, when you're starting to get into those types of meals, pasta, pizza, dinner, a wine that I think has a lot of character. Now, obviously, you know, there's a lot of beautiful Italian wines for that as well, but that's where I love this, this wine. You know what surprised me with that wine? It's at some point when you think everything it's over, yeah. it starts all over again. Like, yeah. yeah, there's a bump at the, like past, like way past the mid palate. And at some point I thought, oh, it, cu it kind of cut short. No, boom, you got a grip and you got a spice, like a cardamom or like a clove and like, whoops, there you go, it goes again. So yeah. that's what I thought, really, really interesting. And to add to that, it may, and it's, I tasted it and when I retasted the, uh, the, the day after, I got a little bit more volume to it. And I saw that development, like when and people, like if you're listening and if you don't always drink, sometimes I always, our members bug me, like, what are you talking about? Leftover wine. Leftover wine. Wine it, the second day. That doesn't that happen in our house. What are you talking about, Carl? But we do experiments, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I had, a, I, I had a really pleasant surprise with that uh, table, harvest, harvest table red. So yeah, really cool. That one yeah. and the Kapskov, I like them even better the second day, which to me is a compliment. I think that's like just saying there's potential to the aging, aging of that yeah. wine. And uh, it's yeah, good. so from the Table Harvest Red, we go to uh, the Cap Franc. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, second highest rated wine in that uh, in, in the pack. This is modern South Okanagan heat. It's uh, it's a reflection of 2021 vintage as well. It's bold. It's juicy. And sometimes, like to me, there's two there's two sides of the Cabernet Franc. It's either the Parisian one with the red pepper, or or there's that chocolate black forest cake. It's either or. And I got in that one the second option. It's to me. It's like it's. It's whipped cream, it's cherry compote, it's chocolate. That's the definition of a back forest cake. Uh, and that classic spice at the end of Cap Franc. And yeah, I love that, that modern Cabernet Franc. Am I, am I completely off the rail here with my description? No, uh, you could do my job if you want. Uh, I'll just let you know. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things about Cabernet Franc, and in particular, this actually comes from a vineyard really close to the lake. Uh, like a Soyuz, for those who are wondering which one I'm talking about, because there's a few. Um, a really great partner of ours. Um, and so we get a bit more moderation in this vineyard site. And you can feel that in the glass, um, I think, really beautifully. Absolutely. Lots of cherry, um, a slight confected note, but not jammy. Just, just a little bit of that kind of confection around it. Um, lovely chocolate. Um, I find a bit of licorice in this wine. I think it really kind of comes through for me in the mid palate in particular. And this like a very sort of subtle dried herbaceousness and then finishing on that spice. It's it's why I think Cab Franc will probably be the signature varietal of the Okanagan for many years to come. And um, certainly it's it's a style that we're really excited to be able to continue to sort of pursue down down the rabbit hole over the next, you know, many years of Valley Commons production. So, yeah. Lots and of is it just uh, is it uh, for the only that my source or whatever? But Capron was uh, affected a little bit, like with Syrah. Capron was pretty heavy affected with the frost. Franc was better than Syrah. Syrah, oh, I think. Yeah. Um, I Syrah got back. decimated. Yeah. Absolutely decimated. Yeah. We're um, we are expecting that it probably won't be Syrah time for another few years. Most yeah. Syrah vineyards in the Okanagan have had to be replanted, um, which is very difficult. I think Syrah was one of the other really great Okanagan varietals when it works. I think it's exceptional here. Um, but I think we're all going to be waiting a little bit to see if people are replanting with Syrah 1. And then um, once it starts releasing kind of what that quality looks like, because there were a lot of older vines um, producing Syrah as well. So we will uh, we will see. But um, yeah, Franck has taken taken a bit of a hit. Um, but like I say, certainly a little better than Syrah. And um, we're really fortunate we're going to be producing this wine again next year and the year after and um, from that same vineyard site. Uh, so we can get some nice continuity because I think it really is a special wine. And it's a wine that this is our sort of first real try at making uh, Cabernet Franc. 
So I feel like we've actually got room to improve, which is quite exciting as well, because I think we really kind of hit the nail on the head in a very challenging vintage. So I, I totally agree with you. I did not expect that much. To be honest, you told me like that was the first try. Uh, the, the, this is the first kick at it. I did not expect that much. And I was extremely pleased with the quality and the overall expression of it. Not overdone, well balanced, but truly South Okanagan, just like you mentioned in a very challenging vintage. Let's remember 2021 was the heat dome, like 45 degrees temperature in late yeah. June and early July, what we've never seen before. So uh, yeah, absolutely, you're bang on. And uh, before I let you go, Andrew, I just want to touch base on uh, a uh, on Amira's favorite on that on that. Yeah, flag. there's <laughs> two bonus picks. There's even more because people have asked. So you, if, if Stone Boater Valley Commons has it in stock we can probably add it on maybe we can sweet talk andrew into it but um this cab stove i actually have in my glass right now one of those vicky that is better the next day uh so yeah we really enjoyed this cab so and that's one of the bonus picks i like the graphite all of that like that pencil lead comes through this is truly black cherry the black fruit black cherry black currant uh i got that black licorice as well past the mid palette and is that really classic uh herbaceousness of the south okanagan so yeah really really classic cabernet um so i truly truly enjoy a 90 plus points here with carl's wine club so yeah what's the uh, what's the source of the of the uh, the vineyard here for that 2020 so that's coming from a vineyard directly adjacent to the same vineyard site as the cabernet franc so again a little more moderated and a little more um i guess uh kind of shortening that diurnal range what i love about that wine is it's got a sharpness to it I think Cabernet Sauvignon at its best can have the ability to be so bright of acid with little bits of floral while still delivering so much of that sort of Cab Franc style character in so many regards. And so it has a bit of a razor's edge of acid in it, but it's beautifully encapsulated in all these lovely flavors. Um, and 100% the great sort of graphite kind of minerality characteristic in the finish in particular. Lots I almost nice define it as a charcoal, as charcoal, right? You know, like that, you know, like like rustic tannin. Yeah, yeah, it's it's beautiful, and yeah. um, what I think is really great is it's ripe, but it's not overripe, and so it doesn't speak to me of green bell pepper or underripe sort of characteristics of Cabernet Sauvignon, which can be quite challenging when the pyrazines sort of get more more out there. Um, but it's also not losing itself into jamminess and losing its acid. And so it feels like a really great pick day in a really great vintage. And that speaks um, volumes. And I agree. I think this is a really special wine mirror. I think this is and a wine worth laying down for a few years and circling back to because it has a bit of that sort of um, classic Cabernet Sauvignon where it's so youthful right now. As you let those tannins drop out and let it integrate, I think it's really going to reward you beautifully for it. When you offer me a capsule of under 14% alcohol, you get my attention. I'm allergic to these big, over heavy, over extracted uh, capsule. And uh, this at 13 and a half, you got, and you got me so curious. And I, I really, really enjoy the, the, the style, of the, the, the kind of precision that you get in that, uh, in that medium plus but still like like um, like there's enough body to but they quench your thirst so i yeah well and, done and go with the steak we're having tonight <laughs> absolutely absolutely so andrew yeah. i know i kept you on a little longer than expected my apologize for that i uh, listen i enjoy watching the view behind you seeing some blue sky uh seeing that like showing our people that it's not the entire okanagan who's been uh, like like tremendously under the smoke. So uh, again- well, it was, but today is the first day in what yeah. a week that you've really seen the blue skies, right? So Yeah, really, it cleared out um, yesterday. We were, mm -hmm. we were definitely uh, dealing with some challenge, but uh, by yesterday afternoon, we could see the sky and yeah, it's just getting beautiful. Um, I just wanna say thank you uh, so much, Carl, Mira, for having me and to all the people that are, are listening. Um, thank you so much. And uh, if you're ever in the South, we'd love to host you. Please come on by. Um, we've got two really cool properties and uh, I think we can do a really special experience for you. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Andrew. you, Andrew.
keep up the great work, my friend. We'll chat okay with very, very soon. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, guys, so this week, until Sunday, you can order the Stone Boat and Valley Commons wines. Uh, the link is in your emails if you're a member. And if you're not, I will slip the link in the comments in a second so you can grab any of those wines that you'd like to get. Um, in the meantime, there's uh, there's more uh, wines offer on the link as well. I think there's the, the Stone Boat Sparkling and uh, there's many other uh uh, other wine that we have included, but I have tasted um, what six, eight, eight, okay. eight of the oh, eight of them. They are in notes uh, on the link that we have right there. So uh, yeah, to me it's a revelation. To me it's a surprise. To me to have two amazing, amazingly drastically different producer in the same portfolio uh it makes it so exciting because like we mentioned from the pinots to the big bold red like like we have so many diversity in that bag and makes it awesome and when you have such a newcomer a uh, coming like emerging you never know exactly what you're gonna get and like for for, for valley common it's surprise after surprise after after like wow and yeah. oh wow i mean one thing we didn't talk about and i think is important to mention is the um these guys did a really good job involving people who really know what they're doing That's so true. pascal madavant has been quite involved with stone boat over the years he mentored the current winemaker and also when they started valley commons pascal madavant this is of um where is he from? Oh, so yes, really Rose. Oh, so oh, so yes, Rose. Rose. Like 15, 20 years with Osea oh, so Rose, one of the the staple of the South Oak. Yeah, Island. so when they so, started Valley Commons, Pascal was right in there as a consulting winemaker as well. And uh, they each have their own winemakers at the at the respective wineries, I believe. But, yeah, um, and there's also see the expert touch in that, like people who really know what they're doing. Absolutely, absolutely. So Kyla and Rudy are doing a great job uh riding the boat there and uh yeah we're happy we're privileged uh to be uh to be working with you guys this week so you're gonna see posts all week long uh regarding some of our uh highlights in that pack and uh yeah if you want to try something new holy darn this is a good way to go yeah um, so yeah. speaking of wine that's been open more than a day and how it tastes the next day so marcel marcel morganston at Bellaterra Vineyards, who we just completed the Pan Canadian Masterclass event with last Friday night. Um, he says, just finished the last bit of Red Icon after five days open and it rocks. That is awesome. <laughs> we were just saying, we thought that wine has so much potential. It was maybe even in a bit of a, a lull right now because it has so much <clears throat> that I think it will have going for it in the next Oh, Five, absolutely. I mean, this this wine is just rock solid. I mean, and like when you compare it to some wine who are uh, on a on a upswing sometimes, like wines are roller coaster sometimes. And I felt like maybe the rock the the the, the red icon was they just a tad a little bit on the little sleepy phase. And uh yeah, but there's no doubt red icon is a wine that can be drank for 15 years. Like no doubt about that, and uh, yeah. So you know, there's uh, we were so privileged to have a lineup like we had at the first Pan Canadian Wild Masterclass. So let's do a little recap because yes. we travel overnight last Friday, uh, last last Wednesday. Arrive on Thursday morning. The masterclass was on uh, on a Friday night. We had a full day of touring on Thursday. But before we talk about the, the train, let's talk about the masterclass. What you see here on the screen, okay? That this is why we were so excited to put that event together. If you go from the Tidal Bay Tasting Room in Nova Scotia, in the Annapolis Valley, and you hop in your car and you drive to Alder Leah, Alder Lee Vineyard on Vancouver Island, you will have drive 6,023 kilometers. We looked it up. 6,023 <laughs> kilometer apart. So we had these wines served side by side at the Pan Canadian. If it's not something special on its own, uh, I tell you one thing. It was like that to me. 
I had goosebump thinking about that, and that happened. First, we had a multiple channel rosé to, to so, start. I mean, we, we were taking pictures. There's so many great wines that were in <laughs> This that is the movie. lineup back where here you go, and boom. Boom. Yeah. This is the multiple channel rosé. Completely sold out. Completely sold out. Uh, they sorry. only made, what, 59 cases, I think? Yeah, 60. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, maybe 65. 65 cases. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the good news is I had a chat with Sal this morning that the Montepulciano Merlot blend will be available for purchase soon. So if we do, and I think we will, we already talk about it and thinking about it, the BC version or the second pan Canadian wine masterclass here in BC will have a multiple channel red. That's crazy. What's so special about these two, multiple channel in Canada? What's so special? Because there's no one else who has it. There it's is the no first time ever that someone's planted multiple channel mm -hmm. and made commercial wine with it. There's one acre of multiple channel planted in Canada, and Sal Dangelo got it in uh, on the Naramata bench. And it and tastes delicious. That's it. That, <laughs> that, that was the only thing. That was the whole thing. If you crack that bottle open, and the color was lovely, that rosé was just fantastic. So we started the night with that multiple channel rosé as a welcome drink. Here is me and uh, Keith Tire, winemaker at uh, Clawson Chase. Chase and Prince, Prince Edward, Edward County. County. And uh, yeah, followed by our two coast to coast wines, which was the Tidal Bay uh, from Domaine de Grand Pre and the elderly Pinot Gris, Ramada, the Ramado style Pinot Gris from Vancouver Island. And these wines cannot be more different from each other. It was just absolutely incredible to have that side by side. There you go. Look at that color. That's the rose we were just yeah, talking look about. Look at that color. So that was our welcome drink alongside, or just before that was a Bella Terra bubbly. Uh, I think the biggest problem at this tasting was people were like, oh, wait, I haven't finished all these wines yet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have Bob Nadalco here. He's a, a great brewer in Ontario. And uh, him and his wife were a happy customer. They were a happy uh, guest at, that, uh, at the event. Um, and so uh, I was the host of the night here. Yeah, uh, this looks like somebody who was ho who was MC. Yeah, someone someone who was the kind of <laughs> talk his face off for a couple of hours, maybe for too long, according to some yeah. other people. But so it was a great group. We had six winemakers actually in person. Rob Hammersley uh, flew in from BC. Richard De Silva flew in from BC. Uh, Keith Tires came in from Prince Edward County after it's quite a drive. It's like a yeah, four hour drive. Four hour drive. Way. Yeah. And then we had three from Niagara. We had uh, Brian Schmidt from Vineland. We had Lou Puglisi, Lou Puglisi from Bella Terra, and, and uh, Ilya, Ilya Senchuk. Senchuk from Leaning Post. So it was quite a group. And I think to me, outside of the lineup, because the lineup itself was something unique and special that we talk about, we thought about that inside and out. And the goal was not exclusively to put to select the 10 best wine in Canada. That was not the goal. The goal was to showcase the diversity of grapes, the diversity of the regions, and the diversity of the stories behind all of that. So to have a mix of stories and, and producers, grapes, and regions. So after putting all that together, uh, I we thought that the, the lineup was exceptional. But the highlight of that is to have these six people and to leverage the energy and the knowledge and the history of these six guys and to leverage that to have these guys generously exchanging among each other. And uh, I think it was uh, it went better than I was expected, to be honest. I didn't expect that much of emotion. I didn't expect that much of uh I think that of generosity from these guys. I didn't expect that of uh, it was just unique. Like like the the the, the atmosphere in there it was, was really uh, special. Yeah, I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. So anyway, so 
So those of you who were there, many of you live right now are there. We're still looking for feedback. Uh, we'd love for you to share a little note with us of what we can do to improve the event and what you loved about it because uh, we're serious. We want to take this to every major city. I think we want to do something very similar to what we did in Niagara out in BC wine country first and then hopefully take it to all the major cities. I don't know if we're going to have the winemakers necessarily in person at those cities, but Video, high quality video showcasing these stories, absolutely, and the opportunity to taste. So we are just structuring through that right now. Yeah, it was uh, clearly like that was fantastically unique and emotional. I think that, yeah, I, I was, uh, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with the outcome of it. But the whole thing is we took a group of people. We had a group of members joining us. We stayed together in a big Airbnb. And we toured around for a couple of days. I need to get back to our tasting. Uh, oh, before whoa, before we uh, we finish, that night at Bellaterra, that night the Pan Canadian, the first ever Pan Canadian Masterclass, will have not been possible. I'm telling you, Mira and I, without Marcel Morgan, sir. I'm not sure if you, if you listen, just plug you here. I don't want you to hear me talking good that good about you, but. This guy, without the help of that guy, this project will never have happened. He worked his butt off to make it happen. He put his staff, the winery, his knowledge to our disposal. Uh, we were treated like family there. Marcel, thank you for your effort. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your generosity for, for being such an amazing host. So without Marcel, wouldn't be possible. Second, we had two amazing sponsors. We had Lakeview uh, Vineyard Equipment, who did a great job supporting us. Lakeview uh, sell uh, vineyard equipment across North America. And, and you might see them in The Amazing Race, apparently. They supplied a ton of uh, tractors. For exactly, exactly. And... ASL uh, print, uh, print FX. So, and they create label. a lot of the labels you'll see on Canadian absolutely. Wine. And I've heard that ASL love so much what we've done at the first Pan Canadian that they uh, are uh, interested in to know when are we going to do something else because they would like to be associated more, which is exciting, which is really exciting. Mm. So Marcel, you're an amazing host, says Vicky. Thank you. Absolutely. So now we had a couple of uh, really special uh, tasting as well, some tours from wineries. I have to start with Leaning Post. On the, on the Thursday morning, after flying from Vancouver to Toronto, get our rental car after maybe like 45 minutes of a little snooze on the plane on my, on my partner's shoulder and... Uh, like very little sleep. We started at 1015 at, at Leaning Post. And uh, you know what? We just, I was myself and Rob Hammersley and Michelle from Black Market and Mira, the four of us. Um, and uh, we had a, uh, one of our members texted us, hey, I'm on my way. Uh, so he joined us there. And we, what were you expecting at Leaning Post? I mean, well, I knew what we were getting into. Uh, <laughs> okay, but okay. Uh, Daryl, Sandy, uh, Rob, Michelle. Yeah, we had. We're in for a nice surprise. We ended up by tasting 14 different wines. 14. To start at 10, 15 a.m. That was our first tasting of the day. Uh, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, Nadia fun. and Ilya Sanchuk were so darn generous uh, we had an amazing time. We visited the whole thing. Um, Elia, his knowledge, his passion, his dedication to his craft is absolutely unparalleled. So it was absolutely like, and if we didn't, that's funny because I scheduled the day. I said, we're going to do only two tasting that day because I don't want to rush it. I know we're starting with leaning pose. It can, it can last pretty long. So we're not going to rush. So, if it wasn't by the fact that we had another appointment at one, <laughs> Ilya would have kept going. He wanted to open oh, more yeah. wines. It was just absolutely We could have crazy. spent the whole day. We there. could have spent the whole day there. Absolutely. It was epic. Absolutely epic. And I have to say, as a Chardonnay guy, uh, I mean, mm. he's doing some of the best shards in the country, right up there with Thomas Batchelder. Uh, these were, I we tasted 
Senchuk Vineyard, Grimsby Hillside, and uh, which one was the other one? Uh, anyway, three or four Chardonnay side by side were absolutely freaking epic. He's also a Pinot Noir, a, a Pinot House. There you go. So, did you yeah. show that one? No, I want. Let's do a very quick. Okay, very quick run through of these tours. We had uh, four, five wineries we saw outside of the masterclass. Yes. Okay, and I want to finish with Suan because that was an incredible evening as well, and we celebrating her as our winery of the year for Carl's Wine Club. Uh, member votes. Um, but yeah, we started our day in Niagara at this awesome little hole in the wall restaurant. In where Hamilton? The prices were from uh, like 10 years ago. It oh, was outrageous. 25 years ago. It was I like, mean. like, look at these breakfasts. <laughs> it was funny. It was, you could get like a serious breakfast for under 10 bucks, including tax. Crazy. Yeah. So we started that off some, um, excitement about the flights because Richard and Twyla da Silva's flight got canceled. So did Robin Michelle's, but they made it there for the morning. Here we are at leaning post with Ilya Senchak. And one of the cool things he's got there is, is some um, old fashioned style of uh, concrete, concrete tank. tanks yeah. uh, that they just put in. So that's pretty cool to, to see there. You can see Rob's face here back one, one more. Yeah. I mean, if you came back, uh, like, it's anyway, like, really? wow, yeah, 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 yeah. They pour the concrete in before they finish off the the shed, so uh, the, the cellar. So it's pretty interesting. It was yeah. really, really cool. And then what you got is Nadia came yeah. to join us. Nadia, she's a psalm, and she's uh, she's Ilya's better half. And here we are uh, in the vineyard, the Senchuk Vineyard, with uh, Sandy, Daryl, and Michelle and Rob. Um, so yeah, and here we are for our, fourth. this is where we, we need to point out the Niagara escarpment. If you are from BC and you go to Ontario wine country, they'll keep talking about this Niagara escarpment and you ask what it is and they say, Oh, it's a mountain. And <laughs> from BC, we're like, what mountain, but that's it there. If you see in the horizon, you see this kind of Elias pointing it out right now. I mean, Michelle's having fun about it. Yeah. She's <laughs> like, that's the thing. That's okay. the escar see, she's pointing it out. She's like, there is the escarpment. But actually it has something very interesting of a role to play. It's it also what a, a critical, a site? critical, a critical, critical role, uh, because it's kind of a wall between the, the Lake Ontario and what creates the airflow into the region. Mm -hmm. So it is absolutely, it's the biggest influence in the terroir of Niagara. Is especially that escarpment. That, that is mm -hmm. the escarpment. So uh, here's the boys here. Uh, and uh, yeah, we had an amazing Rob tasting. from Black Market Wine Company. So yeah, that was just awesome at Leaning Post. Holy smokes, what a treat. Um, and uh, you can see Carl's. <laughs> very, pleased, very pleased that was the geek uh a riesling where 10 years of lees like a solera style lees uh every year they, they throw the lees from that vintage into the same tank and throw the new juice into a uh a combination of 10 years lees so it's really really cool what they're doing in that so yeah so that's the shards there's the shards. So yeah, well, that, there was a Wismer Foxcroft that I uh, mm -hmm. forgot. And uh, apologize, or something. We might see some uh, little uh, tiredness in our face because we haven't slipped the slap. Yeah, we did the red eye flight, <laughs> but on purpose because otherwise that day with them would not have been possible. So yeah. then we had the Pinot flight, which was also outstanding, so good, and. Uh, I wandered over to the tasting room. We didn't taste this, but I thought it was kind of fun how the black market crew was there. Yeah. And they make a piquette in BC. And then these guys in Niagara are also making a piquette. So that's kind of fun from the leftovers of the winemaking process. So from that point, we're like, guys, we have 45 minute drive to go to our next appointment. And, uh, and it was what, like five minutes before one? So yeah. we managed, even with four hours, three hours between our appointments, we managed to be late, to be an hour late. But you can see that we're having fun, right? <laughs> we bought a lot That's of the wine. crew. That's the crew. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Yeah. So at the next stop, 
Holy smokes, the that group, was a treat too. The group crew, uh, the, 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 the group grew. Yeah, the next stop, word was out that we're in Niagara. So Marcel comes over. Uh, Mike Laplante, Mike Laplante the, the average, Jen, the average wine over. enthusiast joined us. We were we went to Lely Winery and Stonebridge Vineyard. Long story short, is an old school, like like one of the oldest vineyard in Niagara on the lake, uh, who had uh who were who was sold, uh, had a really rough episode for a couple of years and got purchased, and now they have two brand. Uh, merged together, and we were there to, especially to taste the Stonebridge wines, who absolutely blew my socks off during my our Chardonnay marathon. And I wanted to know more about these wines. So, what was supposed to be a five wine tasting <laughs> turned out to be a what fifteen wines? I it was a lot of wines, great wines, and also barrel sample, barrel sampling, and like it just. It was a an incredible experience. Yeah, we got to meet the owner. We got to meet Bye. the yeah, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it was really, quite really, a special really, experience. really special. I love these wine. You know, I'm so thrilled that we had members with us on this tour because, guys, this is the kind of thing Carl and I get to experience every time we go and find a new winery, and we call the owners, and they pull out this incredible tasting for us. And we just always are thinking like, gosh, I wish our members could be like here and experience it. So now you guys did. I think it was great for yeah. the, those that were there. And for those that weren't there, I mean, we'll try our best to do coverage of it. But I think we need to start doing some wine touring Carl's Wine Club style. For those of you that want to uh, experience these wineries behind the scenes like we have. <laughs> As Marcel saying, no comment, no pictures. <laughs> He was yeah. being harassed by the paparazzi, so he's a little bit uh, sensitive to that. Yeah, so we tasted <laughs> uh, a Sauvignon Blanc botrytis affected, that which was, was really incredible. Cool. Yeah. We tasted some incredible Chardonnays, uh, some, also some, uh, oh, that's by the, the owner here who swung by. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, it was absolutely incredible. What a great experience. After that, we headed up. We headed to, uh, we went to uh, Bellaterra for a couple of extra bottles, bottles of wine. Oh, flights are delayed. There's Richard and yeah. Twyla on their way. And uh, yeah, so then we ended up. The day after the, the, the master class, that was the Carl's Wine Club tour day where we had three experiences planned for the group. And it was, uh, first we went to Pearl Morissette. After that, uh, we're gonna skip a little, like a little faster here because uh, yeah. I believe that your parents have dinner. Well, uh, I believe ready you to go. have a doctor's appointment in ten minutes. On oh the yeah, phone. I sure do. I sure That's do. how it works these Nine days. Nine minutes. You uh, just get a call yeah. from a doctor in the evening when they're done. they ready. Yeah. Days. So Pearl Murray sat. After that, we went to Dominicalis. We need to talk about Dominicalis cool. because yeah. we had lunch in the cellar. Do we have pictures of that? Yeah, so I'll just zoom through. This zoom is Pearl, Pearl. Thank you. Great, great big thank you to Pearl. There you go. And, and then, here we go. We are here in the cellar at Domen Kalis. Okay, one sec. Let me just... Sorry. Nope. There you <laughs> go. Anyway. Uh, so, yeah. Domen Kalis are known to... to um, are known to produce Chardonnay Pinot Noir, but also some great Bordeaux blend. They have a stunning Merlot that we would not have. Is Vicky. Vicky, thank you, because without you, we would not have tasted the Merlot. Well done. At the very end, she's like, oh, I heard you guys make a Merlot. Is that something I can taste? Because they had all their wines open. And uh, we all got to taste the Merlot at the very end. But So yes. that's Joe. Joe, she's the uh, the general manager at the, at the winery. She the, was great. She was fantastic. Her friend, who just got back from Paris, um, she where she... Um, she studied culinary in Paris. Uh, she came and do the lunch for us in the cellar. So we had a lineup of wine who absolutely blew our socks off. It was absolutely fantastic. And just to have lunch in the cellar, I mean, 
Yeah. Yeah, it gets special. Very so special. So it was really, really good. Great stories from Joe. Uh, the story of Kelly Mason, who she's the winemaker there. She's a very, really well-known and respected winemaker uh, in Niagara. So she makes the wine at Dominicalus. Uh, so, yeah. After that, we went to um, Sue Wine Staff because it was... The Winery of Year celebration. Uh, and uh, so as you guys all know, last... Uh, Last year, we had the first Winery of the Year members vote. So we said of all the wineries we discovered this last year, uh, we shortlisted them and then members voted on their top BC winery and their top Ontario winery. For BC this last year, it was De Silva Vineyards on the Naramata bench. And for Ontario, it was Sue Ann Staff Estate Winery. And um, Sue Ann is famous for her wines. Yes, she's won like over 600 national and Medals. international awards yeah. for her wines outrageous especially for rieslings especially for rieslings and um so she but she's also famous for those that really know her uh for the incredible grilled cheese sandwiches she makes and pairs with her rieslings they got little little jams and flavors and it's amazing so she made these incredible that provolone oh, one so was absolutely good. freaking fantastic so we tasted um, Sue Ann's Riesling, the Roberts Block, or the pre <laughs> previously to Roberts Block. Anyway, we've tasted 08, 2011, 2018, and 19, correct? I think so. 8, 11, 08, 11, 18, and 19. No, 19, no. just 18. No, we, we tasted just one four. of those. Late. We tasted four. Reason. Anyway, yeah. so a flight of four yeah, Riesling. Four. Yeah, 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 there were four. Uh, 08, 11, 16, and 18. Yeah, so the Rieslings were phenomenal. Then we tasted some reds with um, chocolate, chocolate as well as an ice wine with chocolate. So, yeah. seven amazing wines paired. And this is Bricks, by the way. When you go to Sue Ann, it has a little label on each bottle that says Bricks approved. This so, is that's Bricks. the winery dog. Bricks is two years old and he's an absolute freaking beauty. We went for a vineyard walk. We had some black market wine. We had some De Silva wine, some Suan wine. Uh, yeah, it was really, really, really cool. Yeah, we got into some really interesting chats in the vineyard here. And then <laughs> just so you can get a better idea, this was... Just a little, uh, what did we do with Carl's Wine Club? <laughs> this was dinner, actually. This is not counting the tasting before dinner. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then last quick shout out I wanted to say is we flew Porter Air on the way out uh, from uh, from Niagara to Vancouver. Well, they from had Toronto. from Toronto to, uh, <laughs> to Vancouver. Yeah, to Vancouver. They have Canadian all Canadian vendors on board. They had uh, Canadian wine, Canadian beer included in the price. May I add? As well as all the food was sourced from Canadian vendors, and it said like the name of the vendor and uh, like which restaurant it's from or whatever. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And if, uh, you, if anybody mm. knows the people at Porter air, we want to get in touch because I think what you're doing is awesome. And uh, also a big thank you to Shuan for hosting us. Uh, she did a great job and it was so great uh, to see all of our friends from Ontario. There were so many more places that we wanted to go that we didn't have time to, but one thing is sure. It's the concept of renting these big Airbnb and staying with members. It's going to stay. I think so. I think it was epic. Every was night, cool. every night we had like wine party. We had winemaker joining us after the, our days and like, yeah, people sharing stories and food. Vicky who brought like a half of a grocery store of food. Sandy who cooked like a more than a bakery cook in a week. Uh, 13th Street. Uh, so yeah, we got tart, some little butter tarts, tarts there. Yeah. Just a few. Just, just like a few, maybe just 10 a, boxes just worth a of few. butter tarts. <laughs> <laughs> but we had some incredible wines. People brought some wines from... Uh, it was fantastic. What an experience. So it was 2023. 2023 Carl's Wine Club Ontario Tour. The Pan-Canadian Masterclass. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, we want to ask a quick question before we go. If we were to do this again in BC, the second edition of the Pan-Canadian Masterclass in BC, we wanted to go wine country to wine country and then all the cities. So if we do this in BC, should we do it in November 
or should we late, do it in, no, late November or early or February? February. If you were someone that wanted to come to something like this in wine country in BC, mm -hmm. would you prefer to do late November or early February? Keep us posted on your thoughts. I know a lot of you guys are in Ontario, so you might not be coming to the BC one, but uh, if you were excited about this idea of a BC Pan Canadian Masterclass, let us know if November or February is a better kind of idea for you. All right. All right. All right. What a great show. So this is Valley Common and Stoneboat uh, week this week. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. But uh, in fantastic portfolio, completely different style of wine. So we got from Cap Franc and Cap Sauve all the way to Pinot Noir Rosé, Pinot Blanc Sparkling, and Pinot Noir. So the, the whole range of style are available in that pack, two wineries. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in uh, in discovering new stuff from the south of the Okanagan Valley, here we are. Cheers. Hope you have a great Wine Wednesday, and we'll see you guys real soon.